I am. This is a, so, so we, we have had a Rutledge uh, edition, and, a edition and this is Bits University Press, which is here in Johannesburg in South Africa. Um, we are going to start with the editor, um, um, Dilip Menon, um, who is a professor of history in the Department of International Relations at the University of Bit Batisfront here in Johannesburg and the director of the Center for Indian Studies in Africa. Um, Dr. Manon works on South Asian intellectual history, the histories of the Indian Ocean and epistemologies from the global South. Um, he will have about 10 minutes to just offer and share an introduction to the book. And once he's done, we start with our discussions and we are going to start in the following order. Zoe Samozzi, who is here online with us. Um, uh, Zoe is an assistant professor in photography at the Rhode Island School of Design, a research associate at the Center for the Study of Race, Gender, and Class here at the University of Johannesburg, and a member of the Race, Medicine, and Social Justice Research Cluster at the Center for the Study of Slavery and Justice at Brown University. She's also an art writer and associate editor with the Para Praxis magazine. We then uh, go to Subeshini Modli, who is a professor in the Department of Media and Communication at the Nelson Mandela University in South Africa, located in Port Elizabeth, where she teaches film studies and video production. In this capacity, she has been instrumental in the establishment of an MA in creative media production, an annual student design exhibition and film festival, and a staff and student research and creative output online repository. She is using her NRF funded project involving women who have been who have experienced gender-based trauma. Uh, applying her filmmaking as therapy. After Subashini, we start with uh, Richard Pithouse, who is with us here in the room. Um, he's uh, the editor in chief of New Frame and the coordinator of the Johannesburg office of the Tricontinental Institute for Social Research. He has been writing for newspaper in South Africa for more than 20 years and is also an academic. You are invited to, uh, to uh, both find the books and publications of the discussants and Manon in libraries, but also search for them online. So we are now going to, to go to Dr. Manon to give us 10 minutes introduction into the book. Right, do I need to be, uh, I need to be looking into that? Now there I am. So good afternoon, uh, everybody and uh, whatever time of day it is in other parts of the world where you're listening to. Uh, thank you all for being here. Uh, this book is a result of uh, four years of conferences, and it also arises from the decolonized education movement that started in South Africa, where students required that universities be other than what they are, that universities be required to teach to a movement, teach to uh, the historical changes that had happened within South Africa, that they could not continue as they were as clones of universities elsewhere. And so uh, a lot of the thinking that went into this uh, was resulted in two conferences and a multitude of conversations with people in South Africa and in the global South, in Latin America, Beirut, China, and so on and so forth. So in one sense, this book is located at the juncture of that triad of words of decolonization, decolonizing and decoloniality in that uh, we have in our parts of the world in Asia and Africa been through the process of political decolonization, but an epistemological decolonization has not happened as yet, which is the idea that has been put forward by decolonial thinkers like Anibal Kihano and more recently by Walter Mignolo, who has become the voice of decoloniality. But all of this is not new, and that is both the plangent as well as the tragic fact that as an undergraduate in Delhi University uh, in the last century, uh, 
uh, Ngugi Wotiongo uh, wrote a book called Decolonizing the Mind, where he was talking about the fact that people in or intellectuals in uh, Asia and Africa were producing what he called Europhone theory, that they were working with local facts, but with a theory that came from elsewhere. This goes back also to Tagore's, Rabindranath Tagore's critiques in his lectures on nationalism in 1917, where he said that as a colonized country, we cannot write our history with histories that come from elsewhere, ideal trajectories that are presented to us of modernity, of nationalism, of enlightenment, and so on, that we need to think with what is around us. We need to think with systems of intellection around us, with systems of thought around us. But at the same time, as an Indian intellectual, Ganesh Devi pointed out, as former colonized people, we think after amnesia. There is a way in which those traditions of intellection are not at hand for one to work with. It's not as if one reaches out from a paradigm that one has been schooled in and it has been institutionalized in forms of knowledge and pedagogy, and one reaches elsewhere in order to recuperate forms of thinking, that those traditions of intellection have been, in many senses, also been part of that epistemological revolution that's got been caused by colonialism, which created hierarchies of knowledge, which created the effacement of knowledge, created what uh, Bonaventura de Sousa Santos called epistem epistemicide, that multiple forms of knowledge were either lost or denigrated or subordinated. So there is no there there, as Gertrude Stein might have put it, to go to. It's not there for you to just work, okay, now we move away from this and we start working with something else. But on, that at the same time, one must be aware of the fact that one, it's the search for or the enterprise of decoloniality is not a search for some kind of authentic space of tradition. There is no there there. We have to work with the, what Walter Mignolo calls the destitution of certain forms of knowledge and we're working towards a restitution. Right? And that's the idea that one needs to think with. There is no unsullied tradition as well. And so people say, well, you know, here, this is the root of nativism. Here you go looking for African and Asian forms of knowledge. And that's not really the enterprise here, because we are thinking about forms of knowledge which are constantly in circulation and dialogue, just as much as the idea of the university in Europe comes after the Crusades. When Europe encounters a civilization that is far superior to it, Merton College, Oxford is founded on the model of the Buck. So if you look at the original document of Merton College, Oxford, it is that of the religious endowment in Arabic traditions, the Buck, as it's called. So there are these multiple circulations we need to bear in mind, and which is why Anthony Appiah, the Princeton, the philosopher at Princeton, said uh, that. There is nothing Western that is truly Western, just as there is nothing Eastern that is truly Eastern. So we have to think about questions of genealogy, circulation, influence. So we are working within an already existing sphere of conversation. So it's not a, it's not a nativist enterprise. Secondly, people say, oh, you're looking back to, you know, do you want to go back to Confucianism? Do you want to go back to, in India, Manu's Dharma Shastra, these there are entrenched forms of hierarchy, entrenched forms of knowledge, exclusion of certain groups. But this is true of all knowledge. Kant was a racist and a misogynist. Aristotle and Plato wrote from within slave societies, which they were contented with. So the idea of democracy flowers like a lotus in very muddied water. So what we have had to do in the course of our intellectual inquiry, regardless of whether we are in the West or the East, is a form of recuperation. Years of work have gone into engaging with these scholars with their probably abhorrent views, some of them, and their enlightened views, some or a lot of them. And indeed, this enterprise of thinking from the global south involves this. When I, as an Indian, work with uh, systems of knowledge, traditions of intellect in India, I'm conscious of the fact that India is a violent, inegalitarian, and hierarchical society founded on caste. Just as much as when we think about Europe in the 18th century, there is not much to recommend it, right? A society founded on violence, which practiced violence on large parts of the world. But the enterprise of knowledge is this form of recuperation. So this 
set of essays, which has 20 essays in 16 languages, ranging from Arabic to Zulu to Kosa to Persian to Sanskrit to Wolof and so on. The idea here was that I spoke with scholars across generations, and this for me is crucial. Arjuna Padure, who is a leading anthropologist, to uh, uh, Noha Fikri, who is beginning her master's degree at Toronto. So it's a whole range of scholars. And the idea is that if you're producing new knowledge for a new generation, it can't come from old fogies alone. That includes me. So we have to create the sense of a linkage with people who are thinking afresh, thinking anew, and who are disturbed by the paradigms of knowledge as they exist. So the contributors to this volume come from across disciplines history, anthropology, political science, philosophy. There's even uh, an artist at the end who produces through very traditional art critiques of capitalism and patriarchy. So it's a very traditional village art in India. And the words relate to questions of self, ethics, politics, community, all the stuff that we, you know, the stuff of social sciences, so to speak. And I'll just speak about briefly about five words and I'll stop there because I think I'm coming up to 10 minutes. The first word is by Noha Fikri, uh, uh, who is an Egyptian scholar, now currently studying in uh, Toronto. She started thinking about the fact that her mother reared chickens on the roof in Cairo. And she was interested in that economy of gentleness and violence, which goes into rearing an animal in order to eat it, where you're interested in the health of the animal, tarbiya. Right, the, word, the Arabic word that we are interested in the health of the animal, but at the same time, you're also connected as a human with your own reproduction through the eating of the other. So, Tarbiya brings together the notion of health, which is a mutually shared paradigm between the animal and the human. So, we move away from this kind of anthropocentric focus on within the social sciences. Arjuna Padre works on a word called Andaz, in a way he did a, uh, his field work in the villages of Maharashtra. And what struck him was the uh, range of approximations that people engaged with, farmers who were in, in, engaged in cultivation about seasons, about fields, about measuring crops, about the measurement of uh, not only the land, but of the produce, which is based on Andaz or approximation. Their approximation rather than accuracy was central to the ways in which they conceived of life. And this was, as you can see, it's a metaphorical relation to life in general. Then the word of Mustafir, which for me is a very plangent, a very resonant word. Uh, Mahavi Ahmed, who is a London School of Economics, writes this word. She belongs to the Ahmadiyya community, a community which is a minority in Pakistan. In Sunni Pakistan, the Ahmadiyyas are subjected to genocide. So the word musafir, which is there in Arabic, Swahili, Persian, Hindi, and so on, which means traveler begins to acquire a different meaning. You travel not only in order to gain knowledge, you travel in order to escape, you travel for others. You don't travel only for yourself. You travel because others are mired in situations beyond their control. So in each of these words, they are everyday words, they are demotic words. Right? Every words in everyday usage, but these writers have begun to create the a social science vocabulary which speaks to experience, which speaks to their experience, the experience of their community. And two other words, one word, uh, a brilliant word in this is Itungutu, which is a Zulu word, which Cynthia Cross and John Wright write about. John Wright has been working for a generation on the Stuart McGregor archives. And this is a word which comes out of an encounter between an old man, old uh, Zulu man, and uh, MacGregor who's compiling a dictionary. And uh, as you know, with the colonial hubris of compiling a dictionary, the idea is that of commensurability. Is there a word in your language for this? That's what a dictionary is based on. So he's collecting these words. Tununu hears about this. He takes the, newly, the new railway line. He takes a train at the age of 80 to go meet MacGregor. McGregor is excited. Tununu belongs to the royal family or is connected to the royal family of Shaga Zulu. And uh, McGregor deluges him with questions. And Tununu then replies saying, 
All you have to do is read and write. As for me, I'm Isitungutu. And this is not a word that McGregor has encountered. This is not a word that is currently in Isisulu. It's not used. So it appears as a marginal note in a project, in a dictionary, a project of power, domination, and hubris. And he writes the word down. What does Tununu mean by this? And Tununu is addressing that gap that exists between the question that is asked and the question that cannot be answered. What he's telling McGregor is your questions are not my questions. There is a space. And that's what creates a disequilibrium. And for me, this is a more profound metaphor for the relation between power and the subordinated in terms of knowledge is difficult to sum up. And finally, the uh, word Aukath, which is in Hindi, Arabic, Persian, uh, which Francesca Orsini, who's a professor of Hindi, was a professor of Hindi. She's an Italian who's a professor of Hindi at, the, at SOAS. She writes about the word Aukath means status. And so she looks at these 19th century dictionaries and lays out the landscape of meanings, but the word Aukath has as its etymology, the root word Vak, which means time. So the question of status comes to be related to time. So status is not everlasting. So she looks at the history of the Northern, Northern Indian landscape where given the violent inequalities of the caste system, everyone has an Aukha. The upper caste has a status, the lower caste has a status. And if a lower caste dares to speak up in public, dress in certain ways, they are asked, what is your Aukha that you can do this? Then she moves to the 1990s with the growth of affirmative action movements, a lower caste politics of self-respect and dignity, where it is now the former untouchables who are asking upper caste, what is your Aukha that you can treat us like this? So that word Aukha hinged on the word time is worked out in this essay that status is a matter of time state and this can be reversed and so i mean this is the question that i always end with so what is the status of euro-american theory what is the all cut of euro-american theory that's a question that i'd like to leave before you as we embark on this enterprise thank you so much um Dilip. Uh, Zoe, do you hear me? Yes, I am here. So go ahead, please. Okay. Um, yeah, first of all, I just I just want to say thank you so much to to Dilip for writing this incredible anthology. Um, I've learned I've learned a lot. I, I I'm I'm so grateful always to think about some of these ideas that um, are untranslatable fundamentally. Um, especially because so much of my work on genocide thinks about uh, legibility and these attempts for uh, a translation of memory. Um, so there are two concepts, I think, in particular that I found really interesting um, to my work specifically. Um, and although, you know, thinking about the South kind of still serves as a bifurcation of the world, I'm really compelled by South not bif bifurcation, not in the kind of east-west sense, but it's it's geographical as much as it is also um, metaphysical and epistemological. Um, I'm really appreciative of this, you know, not this kind of attempt through diversity and inclusion to intervene in the colonial episteme, um, but completely reorient and altogether relocate the centers of knowledge production. Um, and as, as you write early in the introduction, you know, the South instantiates a geographic, metaphysical, and ethical balance and an affective reorganization, one that resists a mere interpolation of other into a, an uninterrupted imperial core, as is always, as is, you know, really becoming the tendency for, you know, academia's treatment of anti-colonial and decolonial thought. Um, it's a moment of maneuver, and I love this word maneuver, um, and to quote, um, you know, Dilip Vyer, uh, Partha Chatterjee, you know, it for me really evokes Michelle Wright's notion of epiphenomenal time, which is her consideration of Blackness as temporally and materially contingent. Um, and it considers the how and the where and the when of Blackness just as carefully as it considers the what. Um, I'm really compelled first uh, by the interplay between these intersubjective concepts of Ubuntu or Hunu in Shona, 
and the Zulu Isi Tungutu because of the implications that they have for Black African, which is to say Black Indigenous humanity, both unto itself and also in relation to presumed histories of South-South allyship and more explicit colonial antagonists. I always like to root myself in the way that Panashe Chigumadzi, drawing on this larger philosophical genealogy of Ubuntu and Hunu, um, emphasizes a set of material as well as ontological stakes to the, to the concept. Because following, you know, Kay Wayne Yang and Eve Tuck and, and scores of others, we have to always remember that decolonization and decolonial thought are not and cannot be metaphors. Um, so in the Shona context, you know, Panache writes, if one wanted to know if another was a person, they would ask a question, you know, munuhere, or is this a human being? One might answer yes or no, depending on someone's conduct, because one's personhood is dependent upon their relation to others. One might also ask the question, kuaita kwe munuhere, or is this how humans behave, either in reprimanding a child for bad behavior or in considering and in addressing a particular group of people regarding the historical treatment of Black African people. And in response to this foundational question, munuere, one might wish, one might respond, Iowa, murungu, or no, they're a white person, because of their historical mistreatment of indigenous people. So put otherwise, white settlers have not been considered Vanu people because of their historical failure to treat indigenous people with hunu or humanity. There's a really interesting etymological unmooredness then to Izi um, Tungutu because of its undocumented and conditional documentation in different English Zulu dictionaries. Um, it's defined as, and I thought that this was really, really fascinating, one who's flustered or put out, made to forget by being scolded or cross-questioned, though well-informed which bears such critical implications for the question of who is able to remember, which is to say who bears legitimate memory and whose memory and kind of epistemic structures can be displaced through an encounter with a more violent or a more domineering way of doing and of knowing. So I think John Wright and Cynthia Cross really beautifully trace um, the kind of subsequent investigations and reiterations of this idea um, and, and really kind of critically and crucially illustrate how decolonial knowledge and the knowledge that we aspire to produce is necessarily collective and iterative in contrast to the way that Western knowing um, really centralizes authority. And what remains so crucial is the way that Tununu remains an interlocutor in his own right, um, such that the interrogated meaning of the word can take on um, different temporal resonances as both the description produced through the specific extractive colonial encounter in which James Stewart concedes to and admits to coercing him into making particular statements through a hostile cross-examination, as well as an idea that has a plurality of interpretations in the present. And so kind of thinking about this concept in the present, you know, it makes me think about the descendant of Herero and Nama communities and how they inter, uh, articulate the intergenerationality of memory of the 1904-1908 um, German genocide in the then colony of German Southwest Africa. And I'm especially interested in the way that they describe violence because the concept of genocide was invented functionally through the courts after World War II. And so, you know, all of these kind of German justifications for not recognizing are the fact that, you know, genocide did not exist until 1948 as a kind of prosecutable um, or, or, or crime. And there's a moment in Jackie Sibley's jury's play, We're Proud to Present, that I find really interesting in thinking about um, this uh, this concept of isi isi tungutu, um, where the actors are debating over how to proceed. You know, it's a meta play about a play about the creation of a play of the genocide, um, and the actors are debating whether they should focus on the colonial figures whose letters serve as as evidence of their activities and their ideas or whether they should focus on the Oveherero who are absent from the archive or rather absented from the archive. And so no evidence exists regarding their immediate survivorship in the way that there are survivor testimonies um, from Armenia or from um, uh, the Nazi Holocaust. And within the staging of the play, 
Um, the foregrounding of the interaction between the German settler soldier and his wife within this landscape of imperial genocidal atrocity feels like a useful illusion for the recollections of phenomena that favor um, a prioritization of psychological profiling and contestation over historiographic situations over the materialities of the communities um, that were harmed, the peoples who survived the genocide and continue to exist in the present. Um, and there's a quote in, in a stage direction in the play that says there might be some distant representation of African bodies, but the love between, you know, the soldier and his wife are foregrounded. And, and it really illustrates the way that, you know, Black people occupy space and certainly exist in some moment in time, but they lack interiority, political agency, or their own expert and objective historiographies, just as Tununu was self-consciously recognizing and asserting the ways he was being instrumentalized in white world making. And so I say all of this to kind of think about the presence or the absence of material evidence and how it either affirms or detracts from the legitimacy of survivors and their understanding of memory and how material evidence, however material evidence is, is defined as this kind of legible um, Western archival practice offers a scaffolding upon which the testimonies of survivors um, of, 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 of living survivors of the Holocaust can be can be structured. And so there's this really valuable contrast of the firsthand testimony of their survivor with that of the intergenerational transfer of memory, an oral and also written and communal testimony that is maintained by the descendants of survivors who, by the merits of their blackness and Africanness and indigeneity and, and former colonial subjugation, were not and are not understood um, as, as viable. So they were people who at the, at the, at the time and even in the present um, did not deserve to speak. They were colonizable people who experienced a higher, a violence characteristic of the colonizing form and a racial hierarchy into which they're slotted and they are an affected community whose present fights for reparations and self-determination is secondary only to a tidy German reckoning and resolution with its colonial crime. But as we know, as Africans, the strength and the depth of these familial stories um, is, 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 is well, you know, keenly and acutely understood. And even if we're going to allow or, or, or look towards a Western legitima a legitimation of this knowledge, there has been a tremendous amount of research that has demonstrated that orality is a keen, specific, um, acute understanding um, of history. Yet how do we translate indigenous metaphysics into a structure of language that is legible to the Western episteme? Although this is a question that is constantly asked through this kind of um, framework of inclusion, this anthology I think encourages us to completely reconsider the necessity of that question. Instead of striving for this legi leg legibility, although it can offer a useful grammar for making demands within a Eurocentric juridical regime that dictates property relations, we ought to be having challenging conversations about Southern actors and the shifting post-colonial relationalities between native and indigenous as it is now Africans participating in the national and state subordinations of communities whose dispossessions have spanned from German conquest to apartheid and into the present. And where um, Izitungutu emerges out of this really vertical interaction, the intertextuality between the concepts of, uh, concepts of um, Ubuntu and Guangxi suggests, as um, J. Keshute writes, a more horizontal and thus ultimately more multilingual conception of intersubjective interactions and collaboratively translated personhoods emerging from a history of Afro-Chinese solidarity. One that, you know, to focus again on this materiality, literally manifested through material support during continental independence movements. Through their contextually variant meanings of intersubjective interdependency, both of these concepts alter, offer, excuse me, an alternative starting point for the enduring and often boring question of whether China is colonizing Africa. Um, and a much more interesting starting point than the one presented by, you know, the persistent use of Lenin's definition of imperialism or the xenophobic pseudo concern posed by the United States government in its anxiety that China will eclipse it as the great world power, though I think in a number of ways it arguably already has. 
Kishida describes how Guangxi's appearance in Western anthropological and finance-centric organizational psychological accounts comes through, you know, the exchange of gifts, networks of patronage, or even outright corruption, which risks ascribing a kind of homogeneity of social practice that affirms cultural tropes and stereotypes about China and Chinese people. But even the recuperative attempts by other, by other Western anthropologists fails to recognize the intersubjective creation of meaning in the way that Ubuntu affirms a co-constituted and individuated personhood that only emerges through sustained and ethical interactions with others, Keshida artfully describes how the inflection of Afro-Chinese relations serves as a valuable canvas upon which both concepts can be evaluated, both for the condition of possibility for mutually beneficial social relations, as well as propensities for mutual destruction, as illustrated through analogous discourses around corruption in both China and South Africa. What is revealed then um, is how the intersubjectivity of Guangxi is entirely dependent on both the context and the actor and the latter's navigation of relationality. It could be about through kind of different um, examples, a strategic instrumentalization of rapport, a demonstration of one's indispensability, a performative solidarity, e.g., you know, for example, the history of, you know, third world solidarity, or whatever inner social engagement is most appropriate or apt in a particular moment. So as much as Ubuntu offers a local analogy for understanding Guangxi, Guangxi also lends itself to a reconsideration of the, hagi the hagiography of Ubuntu. Ubuntu fundamentally is an indigenous offering of kinship and ethical personhood that has been taken up by the nation state as well as the raced and classed beneficiaries of apartheid and weaponized in service of a post TRC reconciliation and absolution that attempts to eclipse the fact that the land question has still gone unanswered. Um, and I think it often in, in this speaking to the, the critical um, point of intergenerationality, I think it speaks to Guangxi offers um, a reconception of Ubuntu for a generation that has been completely alienated by the, the myth of the rainbow nation um, and through kind of fees must fall, roads must fall, and these other movements are really begin to beginning to, not beginning to, but are um, forcefully kind of contesting these, these ideas of, of um, intersubjectivity, of relationality, of the legacy of the ANC, of the land question um, in really potent ways. So I will end there and just, you know, say thank you again for this really important anthology. Thank you, Zoe. Um, so, Bishini, I think you are, you hear us or you hear me? I do. Yeah. I do. I'm yeah. switching my camera. Afternoon, everyone. Um, it's nice to be here. Um, and I'm very glad to have been offered this opportunity to respond to this text. Um, I've taken a slightly different approach to Zoe, but uh, I think some of our discussion does overlap uh, and there are some similar trains of thought. So uh, when I was first approached to serve as a, discuss a discussant on Dylan Menon's changing theory, I accept it because my own research trajectory in media and post-colonial th theory has led me down similar paths of questioning. In particular, my PhD research with South African Hindu women who I taught how to make films in an attempt to get them to um, rethink their representation in mainstream filmmaking, uh, raised key difficulties around two issues. Firstly, the notion of diaspora as, in, as an insufficient concept to describe the contemporary lived experience of fourth to sixth generation South African Indians and how film as a language could be used to challenge existing limited representations of South African Indian identity from a particular gendered perspective. These two issues were raised during my participant research. And I have to say, after nine years, these issues continue to be ongoing areas of critical exploration in my research. 
Uh, in fact, I've just completed a chapter on how we might reconceptualize the notion of diaspora to understand the contemporary South African Indian experience as a secondary consciousness. But I'm not sure that my contribution to that discussion is complete. Um, or that the phrase generated by my participants and myself to express the experience is actually the most appropriate. So I think it's something that we will be, it's a concept that we will continue to work on. Nevertheless, my digression right now is in aid of illustrating how the book under discussion and its focus on the concepts in the global South, whose meanings have either been missed or differently understood, have evolved over time to explain specific spatiotemporal experiences and have challenged Western conceptual frameworks or highlighted their lack in expressing a certain idea or moment. Um, and I find this to be, I want to say translatable, but I use this word with caution, or applicable to how we approach theory used to study and understand the global South across a variety of fields. While I found the concepts highlighted by each chapter and their historical development and application deeply intriguing, some of which I'd heard of before and others of which were completely new to me, I was equally fascinated by the innovation in the processes of researching and writing about these concepts through participant research, archiving, and narrative in various forms. In this regard, I believe that the book foregrounds a complex layered storytelling that often underlies theoretical, theoretical exploration of the global South, but that never quite surfaces. The story of the concept and the story of the author's journey with the concept inevitably and self-reflexively intertwine in the decolonial project. Some, since time does not allow for a discussion of all the concepts and chapters, I will highlight those that spoke most profoundly to my own work. And I begin with an overview provided for the book. In his introductory chapter, Menon appropriately contextualizes where we currently find ourselves in theorizing about the global South. That is, imagining a speaking from after the enterprise of thinking from the global South. Drawing on the theoretical explorations of key writers in the spatial, temporal, and political colonial uh, effects in the global South, Menon offers that we need to perhaps imbue a different set of meanings to our understanding and expression of these ideas, or just think differently about them. Key statements of the text that, um, key statements from the text that in this regard um, are, as, uh, sorry, quote, as Anne Laura Stola has recently argued, we live in a temporal and affective space in which colonial inequities endure. And there is the imperative to think of the post, in brackets, colonial skeptically and insist on imperial durabilities in our times. This means too, that we cannot think about the South as a merely theoretical context, uh, sorry, space. In relation to Chakrabarti's idea of the gift of enlightenment and Derrida's reading of the notion of Pharmacon, Menon comments, um, uh, quote, if life worlds must provide the infrastructure for thinking, raising questions of acquiring and working with the knowledge of languages other than English, French, etc., as much as situating oneself within existing traditions of intellectual in Asia and Africa is important. Overcoming amnesia and developing a sense of thinking from a place is central to the work of theory. We need to move away from merely critiquing the shortcomings, prejudices, and occlusions of the theory that comes from elsewhere and move robustly towards recognizing its possible obsolescence or irrelevance for our concerns. Menon's mapping out of the book chapters, books chapters as such, emerges out of what he refers to as investing a different set of meanings to Partha Chatterjee's characterization of three moments of anti-colonialists in India, departure, maneuver, and arrival, which I found quite interesting. But I won't go into that in too much depth. Um, I just want to now move on to the chapters that I've selected. I have selected chapters that speak specifically to concepts pertaining to or problematizing the storyteller and the expression of the story in the global south. So I've sort of selected that as what I would like to focus on particularly in my discussion. I too, like Zoe, looked at Isi Tungutu, 
in chapter six, and it reminded me of key questions raised by my research participants during our discussion of Bollywood as a cultural artifact and how they read their representation through this mainstream format. Who gets to tell my story? How do I choose to tell my story? Writing Cross's chapter in this regard emphasized the complex tension that the term Isi Tungutu illuminates, that our stories need to be told and heard, but what does committing those stories to a tangible foreign format mean? How does it change our stories? How does it invalidate our practices? Or does it necessarily invalidate our practices, purposes, or the roles that we play? Is the endurance of our stories over time or the preservation of memory in a different format worth the changes in the representation that they are subjected to? So these were things that came out in my research that I felt the chapter on Isi Tungutu um, highlighted as well. These ideas are significant also in light of the concept of Kavi discussed in chapter nine. Like the oral sto storyteller Tabashe whose use of the word Isi Tungutu set in motion several lines of inquiry related to the complexity of remembering through the oral word versus remembering through the written word. The work of the Kavi as poet in remembering the past and informing the present is explored as a tool for capturing historical moments. Shonalika Karl, applying this idea to Kalhana's poem, and I think I'm getting this pronunciation correct, Raja Taranjani, uh, argues that the title of the poem, Raja Taranjani, which means River of Kings, is an allusion to history as precisely this flow of ethical exemplars. This schematic organization of the text articulating the poet's ethicized vision is striking when its didacticism and rhetoric are not dismissed. It is here that the Raja Taranjani displays what Hayden White has called narrativization, or the configuration of historical facts around a plot structure that endows otherwise random data with a unified structure and meaning, thereby rising above more, mere seriality. Narrativity in the Raja Taranjani embodies the poet's vision of the past, endowing that past with culturally sanctioned meanings that etched a profound understanding of historicity in early India. And this for me is really important, specifically in terms of the narratives generated by the participants in my study and the films that they chose to make or the ways in which they chose to um, rethink narrative, okay? My participants conflicted feelings towards the, sorry, I'm reminded here of my participants conflicted feelings toward the passing down of stories by previous generations. While they appreciate the sensory process of memory and understanding the experiences of the generations before them, the sacrifice, the determination, uh, and how this has led to how they now understand themselves, they also feel somewhat restricted, perhaps even burdened by the gendered expectations emerging out of remembering culture and tradition in a certain way, and how that informs who one is expected to be. With this line of thought, I'd like to skip ahead to the chapter titled Adhanariswa, sorry, Adhanariswara, toward the end of the book. Kumari and Zanton's chapter addresses a form of visual storytelling by dealing with the evolution of Mithila paintings that include the Adhanariswara concept, which they describe as a single androgynous god, male on the left and female on the right. As such, Shiva and Parvati represent the ideal married couple and as such have become a standard image in the koba on walls and paper as an auspicious model and guide for newlyweds. This is interesting given the fact that the type of painting referred to had originated in a highly patriarchal society. The chapter discusses also how Kumari engages in a self-reflexive integration of the concept of Adhanariswara into her work to offer criticism of issues such as capitalism, patriarchy, and gender equality. One could argue that this act of using the concept from a particular culture in combination with, sorry, I'm not, with one of their traditional art forms is an act of agency and resistance. Um, I, sorry, 
put sorry i've made notes on my notes so i'm getting confused my participants using the language of film specifically uh, using the language of film uh, specifically this uh, self reflexive documentary mode uh, similarly aimed to resist conventional representations while creatively revisioning aspects of culture that they have experienced as oppressive to them as women. Aspects such as revisiting the significance of the marriage ritual or re redefining the symbolism of the sari. In other words, resisting the dominant from within the spaces, theoretical, visual, etc., that they felt most marginalized. I'd like to think that Kumari's work and the self-reflexive of creative experimentation are an attempt at changing theory using changing theory in practice. Finally, I'd like to end on Yafi's discussion of the concept of rantal, which at first referred to a shoreline or riverbank, but has come to symbolize greater meaning beyond just a place. For example, movement or opportunity, as Yafi describes it, a shift in, significance, in signification from place to process. This chapter had personal resonance for me in terms of the difficulty of naming or labeling an experience in addition to attempting to explain the term and capture the experience. As mentioned several times in the book and my caution at the beginning of my discussion, trans translatability of concepts is complicated. For my participants, being labeled diasporic is uncomfortable. And as they argue, keep them in a constant state of lack. Specifically, aspects of diasporic experience, like longing, deterritorialization, and return, assuming different, and they particularly, sorry, they argue that particularly these, these aspects of the diasporic um, experience should actually be, uh, this should actually assume different meanings. Um, this is reiterated in the following quote from Yapi. Sorry. Um, I've lost my place. I just want to read the quote quickly. The realm of imagine, she, she includes this quote in engaging with Rantau of the past Afro Asia connections. This realm of imagined familiarity generally manifests in the context of Merentau during one's own lifetime. That is, someone in Sulawesi who may never have set foot in Kalimantan may feel connected to it. And if they intimately know it because they have immediate contact with people who have lived there and returned home to share their experience, it is in this direct dialogue that perceived familiarity emerges. However, how would connections between one's homeland and the Rantau prior to one's lifetime impact such senses of familiarity? And what role does collective memory of historical Merantau play in creating a similar feeling of connectedness with that part of the outside world. And if you would indulge me, I just wanna read quickly the, the description that my participants and I had come up with for what they referred to as the diasporic feeling of being. Um, the notion, this is the notion that the diasporic experience does not always have to be direct in order for the perception of displacement or marginalization to be be present in subsequent generations. It would therefore be safe to contain, contain the conventional concept of diasporic consciousness, consciousness be supplemented with a secondary notion of diaspora feeling of being. As such, often conflated with the direct experience of diaspora, the diasporic feeling of being can be understood as a secondary displaced diasporic consciousness, a consciousness that your existence occupies an ongoing space of lack and discomfort, even if the space is the only home that you or your immediate forebears have ever known. This consciousness emerges not so much out of learned behavior, but as an affective response to the experience of your context and history, and as a means of maintaining an awareness of past ethnic injustices, as well as a way of preserving a potentially problematic group identity. It is a consciousness that is inseparable from the South African Indian imaginary, the feeling of being diasporic. Ultimately, the point that I am trying, that I think I'm trying to make about changing theory concepts in the global South is that it offers both a starting point and a necessary development for how, as Menon says, we speak from the South. So even though I've hopped across 
chapters and specified a theme in my response. I believe that this engagement reveals the value of thinking more profoundly about these concepts and their application, specifically in how we teach them and apply them in textual production, written or otherwise. Thank you. Thank you. I forgot to, to unmute. Thank you, Subashini. Richard is with us here and um, he's going to start now. Thanks, everyone. Um, Dilip, uh, Zoe, um, the discussants. Um, it's nice to see some familiar names up there on the, on the Zoom screen, even though I can't see the faces. I really like this book. I really like it. And I think it's interesting that the idea of the decolonial in some ways has been drawn into existing systems of power and production of ideology and theory. You know, universities are allocating money for it. Um, people are being asked to do it. People who have spent their whole lives doing very, very different things suddenly think it's in their career interest to do it. And of course, this, this mm -hmm. happens with every radical idea. Every radical idea is subject to what in his um, new um, short book, Olufemi Taiwo calls elite capture. But it is simultaneously a dissident idea. And you just have to look at the world around us to see how fundamentally dissident it is. I mean, you know, Dilip um, referencing Chakraborty has, the introduction is, <coughs> Someone used the word sparkling. I think, I think you use it. The introduction is sparkling. Um, one of the things that Dilip does in that is, is to use this idea from Chakrabati about three kinds of steps. Yeah, so there's a chapter two. Yeah, yeah. yeah. you're right. I've got it written down there. Yeah. Three steps in, in sort of dealing with colonially imposed knowledge. So one is departure, deciding to make that break. So Ngubi is a, is a good example of, of that. Um, another is maneuver. So trying to find your way within that power structure, trying to do something. And then there's arrival, where you just do what you want to do. This book is, is, is a moment of arrival. But you can't see those things in terms of a set of temporal steps. They're all happening simultaneously. And this book comes out of a moment of rapture or departure. Dilip's very clear about that. He's very clear that this is a political work. Um, that's the 2015 moment in, in South Africa, which is articulated to a global moment of Black Lives Matter. It's a global moment of, of rapture. But it's not the first moment. I mean, this has been happening. It's not just in Ruby. You know, I mean, you think it's 2022. I mean, it's it's uh, 70 years since Fanon's first essay and his first book. And that first essay, North African Syndrome, is about how migrant workers from North Africa are received by French medical professionals, by, by scientists. And Fanon's point is that those doctors, those scientists, have already formed an opinion about them before they enter, say, the surgery. He, he, he uses a, a term from Kant, the a priori. You already know. You don't have to find out. You don't have to listen. You don't have to talk. You know before the person has entered the room. And then, of course, in black skin, white masks, he's got this in, in, incredible um, passage where he talks about reason. And in the university in France, in Lyon, he could not simultaneously be present as a black man and as a person who was committed to reason, who had the capacity for reason, you know? Said when its reason was there, I was not. When I was there, it was not. That's 70 years ago, but we're still in this as well. I mean, two things struck me in the last couple of days about the current moments in the sort of intellectual and political realm. I mean, one is the death of Mark Davis, 
I mean, remarkable scholar. I mean, unique style and accumulation of adjectives as he writes. Um, brilliant books. I mean, I, I've never met anyone who doesn't think City of Courts, the book on Los Angeles, is not a great book. And there are others that I would make similar arguments for, late Victorian holocausts. But, and I know this is like a statement that could get me in trouble with some people I care about very dearly in the US, but you can't write about Africa. You couldn't write about Africa. The book on Planet of the Slums is based on, the sources are things like USA ID reports. There's a complete erasure of um, interiority, something that Zoe mentioned. It's just not present. The people that he's writing about just do not appear as people who have reason. They do not appear as people with interior lives. They do not appear as people who can access the political. It's just eviscerated. <laughs> so we are still in that moment, even in the radical spaces in that Euro-American academy. And the other thing is, is Haiti. You know, I mean, I think someone mentioned, well, Trio has definitely mentioned it in the book, you know, um, his famous book showing that the Haitian Revolution, arguably the most consequential and significant event in the modern world, simply could not be recognized by the most advanced scholars in the salons of Paris. And of course, it was written out of history until very recently, and only, of course, written into history initially from the margins by people like, like C.L.R. James, 38. This week, you know, the U.S. state is saying we need to send the military back into Haiti. You look at how that revolution was encircled by the French, but also by the Americans. They've They've occupied Haiti before, a long time ago. They've organized coups. They've backed dictators. They literally appropriated the gold reserve out of the bank in Port-au-Prince and took it to Citibank in New York. This is not seen as, as a scandal. And it's not seen as a scandal in, in our media, that's for sure. It's actually taken as perfectly legitimate that the US should make these decisions about Haiti and that Haiti should not, not be sovereign. And the, insofar as there is representation in our media, say in 2004 when the coup against Aristide happened, and then after the earthquake, earthquake in 2010, it's just extraordinary the form it takes. I mean, Togo and Becky went to Port-au-Prince on the 1st of January um, 2004 for the celebration of the bicentenary of the Haitian Revolution. He was pilloried in our media, pilloried for doing that. I mean, the Mail and Guardian ran an article under the headline and Becky's Haitian party. This is just utter content for this. And of course, when Aristide came here yeah, and he was received as, you know, as a head of state is received, the same thing. We haven't just not resolved the land question in South Africa. We haven't even resolved the question of, of how we have a public sphere that is not totally colonial. Open the Daily Maverick today. The first article by Richard Poplack, the first line, he's talking about global politics. Who does he cite? You know, it's Freedom House. It's the US state. They are the ones who, who tell us what's right and what's wrong. I mean, you know, China was mentioned by, by Zoe and it's mentioned in the book. If you try and have a rational discussion about China and South Africa, um, you're in serious trouble in, in, in certain spaces. You just, you just cannot do that. So rupture and arrival, um, they're all happening simultaneously. What, I mean, I was struck, like both the other two discussants, I was really struck by, by chapter six, um, this idea of, is it Ungutu? Is it Ungutu? You know, it's been explained colonial official and magistrate is talking to uh, an old man who's who's lived through this tumultuous period, you know, the destruction of the Zulu kingdom um, by the British, the crushing of the Bambata rebellion in, in 1906. And 
he defines himself. I'm going to read it again because I think it's really important. He defines himself in the singular as isitungutu, one flustered or put out, made to forget by being scolded or cross-questioned, though well-informed. It's that last bit, though well-informed. You have knowledge, you have reason, but it cannot be recognized. You know, for none, when I was there, it was not. When it was there, I was not. That's the power of the colonial discourse. It can render you incompetent. It can render you a nullity. It can render you backwards in time. And I think it's really important that the book stresses the politics of that, the materiality of that. I mean, you quote that famous line that a language is a dialect with an army, but theoretical domination may require brilliance, but it also sometimes requires an army and a bank like the World Bank and a whole series of, of institutions and, and structures. So there's something else that struck me in this book, and it's about the politics of this thing, um, which is the chapter by Saul Thomas. And he's talking about this moment of, um, you know, it's, it's Bandung, it's uh, uh, the moment of national liberation movements in Algeria, Vietnam, um, Africa, of course. Um, he, something he says, this kind of third world is an intensified after China's break with, 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 with the USSR. And he says, yeah, images, documents, and films depicting the rural people of Africa, Asia, and Latin America appeared, excuse me, not as backward emblems of their nation's non-modernity, but as rational, rational, normal, dignified people capable of fighting for and winning their own liberation. So in other words, just as we're still making the break, we're still arriving, it's not that progress is all in the future. We've lost some things. There were moments of greater progress because what an intellectual like Mike Davis, who was a committed radical and a brilliant man, had written about people in what he called the slums of the global South in a way that erased their interiority and their politics. In that, this moment of, of national liberation in the 1960s, I think not. I think he would have done a lot better. So that poses the question, how do we recover the political capacity? Um, because, you know, some of the, the decolonial discourse has sacrificed the political to a great degree mm -hmm. to the ontological. And it was the other way around with the anti-colonial discourse. I do think they should be conceptually separate. It was often more political than ontological. I'm not suggesting that those two things can be separated. I mean, of course, they're entangled and ontology is politics and politics is, on, is ontology. But there isn't always that question present about how do you build the kind of movements that can really do this and do this in a way that there's less chance of it being captured. You know, there, any phrase, not any, but most can be captured, but you can't capture something in the same way when there's a political movement behind it. And this is a time of often defeat. Um, there's, it's nothing like the 1960s, but there are political movements in the world, in the global South, that are making advances, that, that do have possibilities, and then they often just get crushed. But you think about Haiti. You think about the struggle against the Duvaliers that continued, the movement that coalesced around Aristide, how it, that struggle continued after he was removed, how, okay, it's been fragmented and weakened, but it, but it still exists. And it too has its words, you know? I mean, the movement itself is, is, is is Lavalas or Fanny Lavalas, you know, the, like an avalanche or flood. But it's, but it's got its words and its phrases. I mean, Tumor Semor, excuse me if I'm pronouncing Haitian Creole incorrectly, I probably am. But a person is a person. It's something with clear African roots. And it's so familiar if you look at 
the concepts that motivate people to struggle here for things like land, but not only, I mean, for things like dignity, at great risk and at great cost, the literal risk of death. And if you read the best work on, say, popular movements in, in Bolivia, you'll see similar things. You'll see that people are generating concepts. And I, I love this book because each of these 20 chapters is like a, a window or maybe even a door into a life world. And it, it, it's humanistic, it's respectful, it's not ontologically fixed, it's not putting these things in the past. It's about life as it's been lived now, it's about its complexity. You know, it's not saying these things are all good. And I think we can do the same in trying to make these connections with a movement like Lavalas in Haiti or Abashali here or um, movements in Bolivia, places like that, because how are they received in the academy? Mm -hmm. It's the same damn thing as when Fernand wrote 70 years ago, there's an A priori, there's a framework and you don't listen to what people say. You don't take seriously what motivates them ethically, politically, what gives them resilience, determination, resolve. You have a system. Uh, and whether that's anarchism, Trotskyism, whatever, it doesn't really matter. But what is seen as the cutting edge of radical thought is often, in fact, the first line of imposing that, 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 that a priori. So I love this book. What I'm hoping we could see in the future is something like this that engages those often fragile moments and, 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 and sites of people trying to build political power in the global South and take seriously in the same way that has been done in this book, um, how people are doing that and what they're doing. Because what happens is if you do acknowledge that, say someone says, look, I'm wanting to risk my life for, for dignity or, or people have words, Uhutali here, that's just backward. They're now pretty modern. They need to be educated. They need to be enlightened by people who have never built a movement. Who's the expert? The people who've done it or the people who think they know how to do it but can't do it? So I find this book exciting in itself and I want to congratulate you and all the writers. I also find it exciting because it opens up a methodological possibility, I think, or a way to think about decoloniality as politics that will not make it amenable to elite capture. So we don't have some accountants in some university ticking a box and saying, oh, excellent, you know, this is decolonial. And, and it, it doesn't run into that kind of quite much. But thank you for this. Um, it's a really important book. Thank you so much. Thank you, Richard. Uh, we will, you will have some minutes to respond before we just open up to everyone online and you to respond I to the discussion. I could say a few things. I could yeah, say a few yeah. things because out of respect, since you've spent yeah, so much time yeah. speaking here to my book. Uh, uh, I'd like to thank Zoe, Subhashini, and uh, Richard for that fine-grained and uh, thoughtful engagement, which also brought in a bit of their own lives into their engagement. And this book is indeed premised on such conversations that I've had across the global South over the last 10 years that I've been here in South Africa. And it's not possible for anyone to produce a book like this with a sense of mastery, right? I mean, the idea of the monograph, which is so central to academics, is premised on this idea of mastery. And here, uh, a volume that brings together 20 people is a surrender of that mastery, a, uh, an engagement in a cooperative enterprise that we need more conversations, which relinquish the idea of a particular politics of knowledge that is so central to the academy, where you patent ideas. Right? So, but having said that, I think there are, uh, I'd like to address two or three things that the uh, 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 speakers, the respondents have raised. And I think fundamental question that both Subhashini and Zoe raised relate to questions of translatability and commensurability, because very often 
our lives are spent as academics and rendering our experiences commensurable in terms of a theory that comes from elsewhere. Right? So we speak about South Africa through Derrida, we speak about the notions of care in India through Levinas and so on and so forth. And I think this question of translatability and commensurability also needs to be put alongside Edward Glissant's idea of opacity, that we need a pause. Opacity is not non-translatability or untranslatability in Barbara Cassin's sense. It's the idea of giving pause, that, you, that some things need time. It's a matter of engaging with an idea is a matter of temporality that is not immediately transparent. It's not immediately available, which is what James Stewart was requiring of Tununu. Right? Tell me, in, in my language, we say love. What do you say in your language? So this question of translatability and commensurability, the more fundamental question that Zoe raised of what is it to become human, right? And this is something that Richard spoke to as well. Who can speak? Who is recognized as speaking? Mike Davis, a person who I admire, whose writings I've grown up on, and as Richard rightly pointed out, what explains the absence of Africa? What explains the absence of an agency that is other than the theory that speaks and addresses uh, a question of you write about people, you don't write with people. Right? And these are some of the flaws of our enterprise and some of the flaws of my own training. In many senses, this book is also an attempt to get, get myself out of habits of thinking, which have been ingrained in me in the academy. So this question of what is it to be human, uh, who can speak, uh, the fundamental question of how to tell one's stories, as Subhashini said, how does one tell one's stories? What is the language that one uses? Does one think about the South African Indian as within the academic literature as a diaspora, or do we need another category? Where the diaspora, the idea of diaspora is composed of that dyad of once belonging and never belonging. Right? You once belonged somewhere, so that when you're in South Africa, you still belong there, you don't belong here. And that dialectic between the once belonging and never belonging generates a xenophobia that characterizes a lot of our politics. And I think this question is crucial, this question of where does one belong? What is the world that one aspires to belong to? What are the conversations that one builds up? Because in many senses, these languages have been brought into conversation in a book. These people have been brought into conversation in, in a book. Life worlds have been brought into conversation. This is what we need more often, which is where the idea of global, the global South, the formerly colonized world, the world that lives after amnesia, is to summon up an older idea from Gayatri Spavak. This is a strategic essentialism. And if you ask me, is there a global South? We know that there is no arbitrary line that one can draw around the world where everything south of that is the global south. It's a matter of the creation of a geography of affinity through conversations, where Richard mentioned Bolivia, Haiti, South Africa, India, these various political movements. And I'm glad, Richard, that you recognize the political impulse behind this, that there is a way in which we have to connect what we do to place to being and to politics, which is, these are the three things that are alien to much of academic endeavor, considering the bureaucratization of knowledge that we're all working with, where the, uh, and you know enough about the political economy of publishing to, uh, for me not to go into that in any great detail. And it's interesting that the word Isi Tungutu spoke to all three of the uh, respondents because it is a word that spoke to me when uh, in conversation with John Wright and Cynthia Cross when they presented this paper at the conference I knew this was going to be the hinge of the volume and indeed as the respondents in their response have shown it is the hinge that there is a sense of the denial of the knowledge of others denial of the agency of others and the address you know where you are interpolated as Fanon put it walking as a cultured, literate, educated psychoanalyst, a young child looks at him and says, look, ma, a Negro. 
right? And in that moment, that's what Pranam becomes. And that moment of interpolation, which is central to our forms of knowledge in the academia. And I think all of these questions are, I mean, there's so much to speak about. I think I can probably speak for two hours through the responses, but I'll stop here. This question of translatability, who can speak? How do we tell our stories? And what is it to become truly human is something. I mean, I think these are the three things that uh, have been raised fundamentally and in a very political sense. Thank you so much, all of you. Thank you, and Dilip. Um, I would like to ask everybody if you have a question, you can just um, ask it yourself or type it so I can read it. And also people here in the room, if you want to share your thoughts and ideas uh, with us. Uh, but as I think I cannot read all questions from here. Would you be able to share it exactly. from your side? I mean, if, if it is typed. So anyone, if you have a question or comment, uh, please feel free to raise your hand so I can see you or type your question. Um, so meanwhile, I would just, uh, you know, you mentioned uh, um, Edward Glissant um, um, and also he has this idea which Suleiman Bashir Jan discusses in his um, so we had uh, we had a lecture at the University of Pali. It's called Amo Lecture Series. It's a long story, so I'll not go into who Anton Belen Amo was. But it is interesting. I was taken as a child to Amsterdam with the Dutch West Indian Company, then gifted to the Duke of Braunschweig, and then mm, they fund his education. He becomes an early Enlightenment philosopher. So this is what we've been working on. So. He, Suleiman Bashir Jan, was invited to give the talk, and his the topic of the discussion was decolonization of the history of philosophy. He focused on the plural, pluralization of languages as a human heritage, but also at the same time on the question of translation, translation from one language to the other as thinking between languages. And he comes to Edward Lisson's idea that writing to the moment of writing must be a moment of standing before all languages. Mm -hmm. But you know, there are many people who have talked and it's not up to uh, have written about this, this, uh, this question of language and the social, right? Um, and so I'm speaking to you as someone who because of migration actually worked with 10 languages. Um, and like you, perhaps, or others in the room or online, I speak, I have learned two alphabets, right? So it's also different, the question of alphabet. But I also learned, you know, and in this case from Derrida, but also other people, like, for example, Nietzsche's idea of language and through, through language as a, you know, as, a, as an army of metaphors that has nothing to do with the world. So in this case, whenever we, we speak about the world in which we live, we translate into language. Mm -hmm. So this raises the question of not how we tell our stories, but how language controls what we tell. So the, 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 the power of language in itself, the authority of language. And in this case, I just have this question of whether you think that language which is something homogenous or heterogeneous, because the question of plurality always raises this questions of that is English and this is Isi Zulu and that's Persian, you know, but also the heterogeneity of language disturbs that unity that we can apply. And this is the question that you raise when we, when English becomes a political technology of control, you know, or becomes inseparable from what in, in the case of many people, but in case of I die if you would accept because I work with this. The question of knowing power, where, where the state, the political organization is, uh, is impossible to disentangle from knowledge. Uh, so that is just a just the question of the question of plurality or heterogeneity. So far, I don't see any. Let me see. Just the uh, box. There seem to people have been writing. Yes. Yeah. So maybe when people read 
to them and probably summarize. Yeah, because while you think about yeah, this, I will, yeah. Mm -hmm. you would like me to address what you mm -hmm. said, I think it's a central issue because when we say we should now resort to thinking with, uh, you know, because our universities are monolingual universities within a multilingual landscape. You know, abandoned language who enter here is basically what is emblazoned on the university door. And for some of us who engage with multiple languages, like growing up in India and four languages, and uh, I try and bring a lot of this, but the central wound, the colonial wound, as Maria Lugones might have put it, is that I grew up uh, in an, uh, what is called uh, being educated in English. My father Rook, was a writer in Malayalam. He wrote short stories and novels, and he was also a bureaucrat. So I learned my own language with a dictionary in Oxford in a library. Right? And there is something there. There is something very really resonant about that recuperation, which has stayed with me. And but the question here is that one cannot valorize language, as Fazil said. I mean, the question of language is that even as we use language, there is something else that speaks through us. Right? The question of training. The question that language is not intimately connected to a life world in any meaningful sense. So that yeah, I may think in Malayalam, but the whole panoply of social theory that I have been educated in will inflect my speaking in that language as well. So, but this is uh, not an impossibility. This doesn't speak to an impossibility, it speaks to a challenge. Right? Or otherwise, we are reduced to something like the Orwellian formulation, where Orwell says that when a working class writer sits down to write a novel, his mind is already captured by bourgeois thought. Mm. And, and this is both true and not true. Right? And, we, uh, and in that sense, that play between life world, language, and that which one wishes to express is something that one needs to keep alive. And there is a tension. Of course, there is a tension. Yeah. Right? But we need to keep that alive. So I, I think. That's what I would say for the moment. Okay, and there is um there is a question is addressed to Richard, but he he also says that um, he likes to hear the speakers. So all of you, um, he says it would be interesting to hear Richard's opinion on the erasure of black interior lives, like Damon Galgot's The Promise, which won the Man Booker last yes. year. Mm -hmm. um, Poland on the sin of omission did a similar thing. Um, so he says, not just Richard, by the way, all of the participants is just that Richard was still on the floor when I started typing. Um, there is Hamisu, there's a question addressed to you, writing, I would like to notify that in my work, I have a different use of concept of terbia. Mm -hmm. In the Niger, I use this concept to grasp uh, fights against moral hegemony of the West. Uh, unfortunately, my mic doesn't work. So, so that's you got the question. There is a, a third question also to you, a pedagogical question uh, saying, if you could choose one or two chapters that can be included in a first year BA histories a history yeah, class, so theory of history course, which chapters concept would you use? Uh, so there are those uh, addressed to all of you. So in this case, you want to start or you want to start with? Uh, no, I think uh, the third question is an extremely important one because obviously with a book like this, one is embarking on a new venture so the idea is to create new knowledge for a new generation, create affiliations with the future, right? And in that sense, uh, contra Benjamin, one would say that in the present, one is always envious of the future because the future is where the realm of possibility lies. And if I was thinking of chapters that relate to the question of history, certainly the uh, uh, concept that Subeshni picked up on Kavi, which relates to the idea of history, which tries to collapse this uh, distinction between affect and reason, that the poet cannot generate history. And I mean, this question goes back to Aristotle, of course, but, uh, but Kavi is one such chapter. The question of Musafir, or the, the idea of travel, 
which is thinking about what Glissant calls the archipelagic sense of affinity. You know, when you think about the Caribbean, the Caribbean is either a mere collection of islands or it's the Caribbean, bound by a geography of affinities. Right? And the other word which actually speaks to history is feticio. Uh, I mean, forgive my, I don't know Portuguese very well, the, that nasal feticio. Uh, Umbanda, which connects Brazil with Angola and Mozambique and looks at the circulation of the idea of the fetish across the ocean, which immediately disrupts notion of national geographies, national histories, speaks to the ocean, speaks to flows, speaks to transnationalism. Uh, you know, any of these words actually, get, you know, all of these words actually indicate the possibility of these archipelagic affinities that Glisson speaks about. And uh, that's the first thing about uh, Hamisi, was it, who wrote about Tarbia. I mean, thank you so much. I mean, I think each of these words, I mean, this, what you have here is a particular rendition by a person of a word through the kind of work, ethnography, field work, life experience that they've done. And certainly, I'm sure the word Tarbia could be used in multiple contexts and generate a multiplicity, a constellation of meanings. Uh, uh, the final question, uh, and then the first question to Richard was about, yes, yeah, so about Damon Galgett. Now, I mean, one doesn't want to be slandering local writers, but certainly the Booker Prize winning novel was, in my opinion, and as one must always say, in my humble opinion, I mean, I preferred his other novels. This was uh, the one that won the Booker Prize was a conspectus of the problems with South Africa including rape, hijack, land grab, everything was there, all the boxes were ticked. And I did not, and certainly the notion of agency, uh, the question that's raised here, black interior life, was entirely absent Though that. I wouldn't take as the most fundamental critique of the book because it is difficult, I think, for Damon Galbert to write about black interiority just as much as it is for Zeke Sinda to write about white interiority. So I think those questions are complex questions, but I think the larger issue would be a particular representation of South Africa, which for me was a kind of dystopia better explored, already explored by people like Kutsia and God Godimer and so on. But this was a kind of version that probably spoke to a moment, spoke to the judges, uh, but I'll leave it there. I can't say anything of any value in the answer to that question because I haven't read the book. <laughs> um, I couldn't read for some years after something oh, a, brain, a, a brain injury and I'm catching up with things I miss now and I read the reviews but it wasn't, I have a copy but it wasn't a priority for me to read it. I've got sort of other things that were more urgent. So I will read it in due course but I haven't got one on well, maybe not. <laughs> okay, and Push, I think uh, you got the answer. Um, we have... Um, um, so, Vishini, do you want to say something about that question? And Zoe, if you have read the book? Um, I've not read the book, but overwhelmingly, I'm not especially interested with what white people have to say about black interiority. I'm, I'm not there, I mean, that's not my standpoint. But that. Yeah. So Bashini, I think she, I know, she's no longer here, I don't know. Until she comes back, we have a question here. Yeah. So, uh, Michael. Well, I'm so pleased you wrote the book, um, listening to, to this from the discussions and, and yourself. I'm certainly gonna buy it. Um, and I'm lucky I've got cash here. <laughs> um, well, you know, there's the incommensurability, the difficulty or impossibility of translating a word from one language into another language. But there is of course the attempt to make it intelligible that yeah. the meaning of the word, and which speaks to I think you you, you referred to it, to it as humanistic, that, that it's like we are from different cultures, but there are things that we share and so we can make this intelligible. And I was just thinking if, you know, it's it's really, you know, there's an enterprise going on somewhere, it might be political, it might be academic, 
but it's certainly violence being done to other knowledge systems and, and epistemologies. But it's even violence being done to all the Western ways of thinking. I mean, you, 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 you made some references to Aristotle, certainly a lot of violence done to Aristotle, um, but even violence done to, um, to let's like, for instance, Western mysticism. Um, and it seems to be in the name of rationality, um, you know, in a sense, going back to, to, to issues, questions about a priori and um, that sort of thing. And, and so, you know, um, I'm not sure where the question is, but um, um, the, it's part of a bigger project that, that is also doing violence to all the Western thoughts. If we want to, you know, if it even qualifies for, for Western in that case. Um, and I would, I mean, I guess my question is do you agree with that? Okay. Um, I think uh, what you call violence being done to Western modes of thought is for me just a merely a rethinking of the centrality of this, yes. right? And which is what the whole idea of. Eurocentrism is about. So if one thinks about the ways in which the world has been rendered and engaged with through that enterprise of Western political conquest as well as Western, the spread of Western epistemology, right? A language is a dialect backed by an army. Similarly, the uh, European nativism presents itself as a universalism through the backing of colonialism, right? Why do we read Shakespeare, for example, as simply Western? Because of colonization and the spread of a language. But my position really would be that one needs to engage with, there are two things here. One needs to engage with the fact that Locke's ideas were used in the conquest of other spaces. They became part of a colonial intellectual armory, right? Where land could be taken from those who were supposedly not using it properly, and therefore the white man could take it over. This is the principle on which American genocide is based on, the dispossession of the Native Americans. Or one could think about the fact that uh, Kant uh, was very like many men of his time, and not unlike many other men of his time, was also deeply uh, contemptuous of the intellectual abilities of women and Blacks, and this is enormous literature on this from Berlusconi to Chikudui, Izzy, and so on. So when we reconsider all of this, it's not to throw out the baby with the bathwater. What you call violence is the process of critical thinking. Right? And so that comes to the second part of it. Is it necessary for us to continue reading Kant, Hegel, and so on? I would say it depends on your questions. If your questions don't require to, you to engage with a whole panoply of Western literature, you don't need to. You can get by happily without having read Kant, Nietzsche, or Hegel, or even Marx, right? And so this is the point of arrival, that one is speaking to life worlds that have been lost, speaking to traditions of intellection that pre-exist any of these Western thinkers, right, which have engaged with politics, ethics, community, <laughs> and so you have Aristotle at one end, you have a whole set of thinkers in classical Islam and uh, classical Hindu thought and in classical Chinese thought who've spoken about this. And all of these come with the attendant problems that European thinking does. Right? Locke has problems, we don't jettison Locke. Kant was a misogynist and racist, we don't jettison Kant. Similarly, we don't jettison Confucius and we don't jettison... But what I find when I speak in Europe is that the first question people ask is, but Confucius, he's a hierarchical person. So, you know, and I think, you know, surely you know enough about Western philosophy, or are you completely ignorant of other philosophies? What occasions this kind of question? So it is not violence. If it is violence, it is a necessary violence. And I think what is important really is to think again with that dialectic where people from the global south, I, for example, over years, and many others in Africa and Asia engage not only with their systems of thinking, but also with Western systems of thinking. What I find in my travels in Europe and America is this resistance to thinking with other 
forms of knowledge. And it always positions itself as a fake humility, right? Which, which kind of hides a lethargy, an intellectual lethargy, where people say, look, I don't know Arabic, I don't know Sanskrit, I don't know Persian, I don't know how I'm going to engage with this. So I ask them very pointedly, do you read your Foucault in French, your Hegel in German, your Agamben in Italian? You don't. You read it in English. Similarly, the works of knowledge as elsewhere is available in translation, which gets us back to the question of translation, that we engage with the world through language, however flawed, as Fazil says, however flawed the enterprise of translation is, but there is a necessary humility that requires a decentering of what is the hubris of a European universalist. That European universalism is conditional on colonial violence. It's very simple. It would never have traveled across the world presenting itself as a universalism. And I'll stop with an example. I mean, we are given the trajectories of European history as ideal trajectories, right? French Revolution, equality, liberty, fraternity, or the Paris Commune. The uh, scholar from Réunion, uh, François Verge, at a, a seminar advisor, when there was a celebration of the Paris Commune, yet another book had come out on the Paris Commune and you know, all the values that it represented. She said, let's think about what happened during the Paris Commune. And at the time that the Paris Commune was happening, there was similarly a revolt by peasants in Algeria, France's colony. Okay? So the workers of Paris rose up. Of course, they had nothing but contempt for the peasants of Algeria. <laughs> But as a result of the suppression of the Peasant Rebellion in Algeria and the suppression of the Paris Commune, they were all transported. These dissident rebels were transported to New Caledonia, right? They were banished. And into the space where they were banished, the, Paris, the workers of Paris then became the landlords and the peasants of Algeria became the once who cultivated for them. So that's another history of the Paris Commune, which is just merely a reproduction of Western colonialism. And which is why there is Islam in New Caledonia. <laughs> and if one asks, why are there Muslims in New Caledonia? It reflects that history of transportation. So I think one needs to engage with the world. What is it to be human? What is it to engage with the world? Rather than with merely these histories that are now habits of thinking. Right? where the, traject the ideal trajectory for Asia and Africa is the trajectory that Europe has adopted. God forbid that happens. Yeah. Um, I think we, we take this question there and we'll just read and then we can come back to this, to this, uh, to this argument. Um, we have a question from Diksha. Diksha. Yeah. Um, my question drives from what Prof Modli said, burden of memory, also collective amnesia that has been inflicted. How do we reconcile these challenges for a more nuanced methodology and production exchanges and cross fertilization of South, South ideas? Um, so we have also a question from Reginald. Do you do you hear me? Yes, I hear you, Fazil. And oh, um, <clears throat> mine was originally going to be a simple comment, but the question you have just read, uh, I will feed into that as well. We are talking about um, a South-South engagement and. Uh, dealing with the amnesia, dealing with the burden of memory. Um, I think the, the, the diversity of the chapters in the book we are considering points us to something precious. Uh, the importance of resisting uh, a monolithic, a monolithic um, analysis, even of the so-called uh, South. Mm -hmm. And um, being an African myself, but not being a, a Bantu, I hear a lot of this discussion on Ubuntu, Unhu, where I come from, uh, in the Kiswahili speaking area, we hear a lot about Utu, which is exactly really the same thing. 
the fact that significance um, is um, derived from communal living. But um, I, I, have, I am still looking for more discussion that recognizes that the word Ubuntu comes from only one cluster of languages in Africa so that it is not assumed that all the peoples of Africa easily relate with the term much as they relate with the concept. Um, so that uh, we should prepare for new terms coming in uh, that may, again, because translation is not a one-to-one -one thing, may not answer directly to Unhu, Ubuntu, Utu. Because like a Luo that, the Luo that I am, Nilotic, we don't have that linguistic structure. And so the whole issue of uh, plurality uh, even in the, in the South it is extremely important. And this book does a good job of pointing us in that direction. And I hope scholars will not be shocked. I asked this question here some years ago in a totally different forum. And it was kind of wished away like, hmm, we have Ubuntu and that's it, you know, but we don't, we have Ubuntu, but we have other linguistic communities which cannot relate to that term although they relate to that concept. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thank you. And there was a question before. Yeah, no, be sure. there was a question before to Subeshni. I think uh, Subeshni should, uh, yeah, yeah. if she's still here. Are you here, Subeshni? She emailed and said her connection was bad because it's windy in PE. Um, ah, okay, so maybe we'll hold that in abeyance because that question, uh, maybe Zoe could Zoe, answer. Zoe, you can interact, yeah. Because the question actually also spoke to much of what Zoe said, I thought. Yeah, I mean, I'm trying to think. I mean, so much of, of the kind of amnesia um, that I've been focusing on my work is about, you know, German denialism and, and really thinking about the way that the the... The, the centrality of the Nazi Holocaust in defining genocide kind of precludes the possibility of any, of, of, of other um, forms of genocide also kind of, or, or, or mass violence and collective punishment kind of receiving comparable um, care and consideration. Um, but what I, did, what I did kind of bring up, and this is something that I'm really keen on, on, on working through and kind of writing about is thinking about the kind of um, the slippages between saying, for example, the Oberherero and Nama genocide versus the Namibian genocide and the ways that um, the Namibian nation state is participating also in, in these kind in these in, in forms of denialism um, through this bilateral negotiation with the German government that is deliberately um, that deliberately excludes um, the impacted communities. Um, and, and leadership within those communities um, and the kinds of claims that are being made. Um, I think what's been really important, and I guess I, I'll, I can just go into it a little bit, uh, what's been really important in the way that Oberherero and Nama communities are um, understanding the genocide is that it's not just about you know, the, the volumes of live, lives lost. It's not just about this kind of ethno-mathematical calculation of um, you know, what proportion of Oberherero and Nama people constitutes um, uh, uh, the Germany thinking or quantifying um, a reparation in return. What they're also understanding is this kind of trans temporal dispossession. They're understanding the ways that the present independent nation state is participating in this process of enclosure of their lands, of their self-determination that was initiated by the Germans. And so there's this really powerful um, historicization, not only of, of, of European history, um, but also specifically of the Namibian state in a way that runs completely contra to, to the myths of the Namibian state and the myths of, of um, Swapo um, in all of the different ways that liberation parties have, you know, kind of captured um, memory and, and captured the state through this capturing of memory. Like we've seen it with the ANC, We've seen it with Zanu PF in Zimbabwe. 
Um, and, and, and it's really usefully described through, you know, what Terence Ranger has called patriotic history. And so what I'm really interested in and through this, um, you know, not paying attention and, and not, you know, focusing on Germany is, is this production of, as I said, this distinction between the native um, and indigeneity and thinking about what it means when during colonialism, everyone was native. After colonialism, you have some groups of natives who are helming the state and, and participating in Westphalian dispossession. Um, how are we to understand that as Namibia is subsuming this community specific experience of violence and dispossession into a national narrative? Um, I don't know how to reconcile this yet, um, but I think that that's an incredibly important question that is being ignored um, as we're having conversations about reparations that are focusing really on just how the German government is continuing to insult um, Namibian people. Yeah. Actually, this is, uh, I mean, that's an, and I mean, just to think along with you, Zoe, I mean, I think one of the most uh, important things here is the occlusion that happens of these uh, 300 to 400 years of colonialism. So for example, uh, historians have shown that many, uh, many of the personnel involved in the genocide of the Hereros find their way back to Germany and become part of the Nazi structure, right? So, and this is an important thing to remember. This is something that I Mrs. Hare spoke about, you know, the boomerang effect, that when you think about the Holocaust in Europe, and you, uh, it really is a kind of replay of all the techniques of subordination, denigration, and dehumanization that has happened over 300 or 400 years. So I think the, the circulation of histories, the thinking about the world is crucial to our understanding. Uh, the other thing which is really about uh, concepts, again, speaking to something that you had raised earlier, this is a wonderful book by the scholar of uh, Haitian origin, Benedict Gosseron, which is called Afrodog, which I found to be a superb book to think with, because uh, the turn, as it were, that has happened in the social sciences towards thinking with humans and animals together. And this is seen as a benevolent, expansive, a, a gesture and the question of the different relations of different classes of humans to animals that gets occluded. So the relation of the African body to the dog, which is used, mastiffs, which are used in the hunting of slaves, for example, in Haiti as much as in the South of America in the period of slavery. So the relation between the human and the animal becomes a much more conflicted idea. It cannot be glossed over easily. So I think there are these kinds of questions. With Reginald's question, I think I think one of the things, I mean, I, you're quite right. I mean, there is a plurality. This volume speaks to the plurality, but one must not assume that this plurality is something that we have Babel here in Africa and Asia, and there's somehow <laughs> Europe and America speak in a univocal sense. And that is the problem in the way in which we theorize, because when we speak about Europe, we can see how powerless the idea of Europe is right now, right? The European Union is a very fragile entity. And when you speak about Europe, you're really speaking about the experience of a few countries in Western Europe. You're certainly not speaking about Moldova. You're not speaking about Bulgaria. You're not speaking about Croatia. And this was some, a question that was raised 25 to 30 years ago in Cambridge when Roy Porter edited this volume on the Enlightenment. And he spoke about the Enlightenment which is largely seen as a French uh, German phenomenon. And then he spoke about the enlightenment in Eastern Europe and the huge diversity of ways of thinking about the world that came out of the Eastern European enlightenment, how contemptuous Western Europe was of those ideas as well. So there is plurality in Europe, and that is something we need to think with. That is as fragmented an entity as any of our spaces, as indeed the world is. And very often it's always pointed out to us, oh, there is a plurality here. You guys will never achieve unity. That's the problem of Babel, right? There has never been any uh, unity in that sense in any space that can address itself masterfully to a space that lacks that. So anyway, that's uh, a short answer. Uh, so Bishini, there was a question for you. I think you have read it. Would you like to respond to it? 
Oh, she, oh yeah, she's gone off again. So oh, okay. Uh, Richard, do you want to engage this, what has been discussed so far? I think uh, what Zoe, what Zoe uh, discussed just right now connects with your question of, uh, I mean, the imperial role of US in Haiti, and also this, the calculations between the federal government in Germany and the Namibian state and how they kind of try to measure that history through money, literally. And this was the deal, this was the agreement between the two states recently. Absolutely. And perhaps we could connect that to Dilip's point about John Locke, because Germany now, and obviously the US now, would see themselves as exemplars of, of liberalism, mm. you know, liberalism in the broad sense, I don't mean in the narrow American sense. But it's kind of heretical to confront the obvious truth about what liberalism has been. And I think John Stuart Mill gives us a really um, useful insight because in his essay on liberty, what is it, 1869, right up there in the front, like at the top rather, I think it's like the second or third paragraph, you know, he's writing this essay about liberty, which is seen as the great gift to the world from Europe. But he casually says, well, of course, despotism is a legitimate form of government for barbarians. That's a line that Cecil John Rhodes uses. He doesn't cite Mill, but he uses the exact line in Parliament in Cape Town. Now, of course, Rhodes shaped this whole region, what's now South Africa, Zimbabwe. And I think we, I mean, this is the moment of rapture. This is not the moment of arrival, but, or the moment of departure, as it's referred to in the book. But we haven't really taken full measure of what liberalism has meant for most of humanity. There are people like Sylvia Winter who, who really do that. But what it's always meant is rights for some people in a kind of sacred circle. And outside of that, it's not accidental that it simultaneously meant genocide, enslavement, and so on. Because if you read Locke, he gives, you said, a justification for the dispossession of land. I mean, he also worked on the constitutions for North and South Carolina and the straightforward, I mean, yeah. Um, and Mill does the same. Mill says, yeah, all these rights, but they're not for everyone. In fact, they're not for most people. I mean, not even the Irish, you know, I mean, were seen as, as, as you know, I mean, Southern Europe, Eastern, I mean, it really was like Western and Northern Europe. And then, of course, they're settler colonies. And it's difficult in the academy to, to confront what is so self-evident. I mean, even with the Nazis, I mean, Hitler was inspired by, by Churchill. He wanted to do in Europe what, you know, the English had done in other parts of the world. There was inspired by the United States. That right? too, that too, yeah, on the segregation and all of that stuff. But this idea that that liberalism is enlightenment for, for everyone. And it made some mistakes, but it's sort of slowly rectifying them is, is really hegemonic. I mean, I mentioned, I mean, it's totally hegemonic in most of the media in South Africa, but it's not true. The Americans could go and start a war. We can't even really call it a, a war. It was a slaughter from the air in Iraq that cost a million lives and destabilized a huge part of the world but they still get to be the arbiters about what counts as democracy. Mm -hmm. And it's not just in the Daily Maverick. I mean, to my knowledge, there's one textbook, and this I'm coming back to this because your book, Dilip, started, as you said, as a response to that moment in 2015 on our campuses. To my knowledge, I mean, I haven't been reading for a few years, there may have been developments, but to my knowledge, there's one textbook for South African students studying political science. It's called uh, Puzzles in Political Philosophy. There's no black authors in there, not one. Mm -hmm. Not only that, <laughs> it's got this line, it says, the conversation about freedom begins with John Stuart Mill. Okay. Okay. 
And actually, this uh, you know the the reason why I edited this book was that I was at a conference of the Association of African Studies in the U.S. and that uh, two academics in an American university had brought out key words for the study of African history and development. There's not a single word in an African language. The words are all in English. Right? And what was interesting for me is that many of these European scholars don't do not, they work on Africa but do not know any African language well. Right? And this would be considered risible. In fact, I'd be laughed out of court if I wanted to work on Germany or France. And I said, oh, I'll work with translated text as sufficient number. Right? But I think these are the ways in which the political economy of knowledge functions. And, and we are stuck with it, or we are not. We can step aside, as Walter Mignolo said, this, or going back to Andre Gunder Frank, you know, this question of delinking. What, what exactly would be the dimensions of our delinking from a certain hegemonic knowledge that actually silences humans, that does not give to large parts of the world the power to speak for themselves or the right to speak for themselves, and that continues. And this is very evident in, I, I am in the Department of International Relations as a professor of history for my sins, and I contend daily in my classes with the idea of failed states and the uh, idea of Westphalian uh, nation state and sovereignty, the myth of Westphalia, which actually governs and undergirds a discipline of international relations where there are the sane ordered spaces of the world and the spaces of madness. I think there is no connection between the two. Right? I mean, the failed states are a product of a much longer history and of a continuing interaction, which includes coups, assassinations, and so on and so forth. I mean, uh, there's a wonderful book which came out recently called White Malice. Um, I'm trying to uh, remember the name of the uh, author. And what it speaks about is the destabilization of every African country since independence through intervention by Europe and America, and which includes the boiling of Patrice Lumumba's body in acid. Right? So anyway, but that's another story uh, which we which I leave aside for the moment but I think a lot of this informs or should inform and continues to inform the ways in which I think about this idea of a very uh, denatured etiolated knowledge that we produce in the universities it has to be political we cannot but be political speaking from Asia and Africa or as Asians and Africans or people of Asian and African origin and so on uh, our time is up, uh, Zoe, but if you would like to say something before we end, or if there is a question here. No. Zoe? Um, no last words from me other than to just thank you for the invitation and the opportunity to talk about a really, really wonderful collection of, of writings and ideas that I will be pouring over for a while. Um, before thanking everyone, uh, I just wanted to share three things. You know, there is a, I was teaching with, um, at the University of Halle with Richard Rotenberg, who also works at BITS. Uh, we were teaching um, phenomenology, pragmatism, and anthropology. Um, while searching, I found a documentary because it's not always easy to teach these through texts. So students are more attracted to the visual and that story. We found a, an incredible documentary called American Philosophy. So there are debates around whether there is American philosophy and how pragmatism comes from Native Americans to what is American philosophy. Richard Rorty has one point. He says he thinks there is no such thing as American philosophy. And he says one simple example is just go and find out how many students in the United States are interested in studying philosophy. His response is less than 1%. The second thing is I had a friend, uh, Christian Nyampeta, an artist who works in US and Rwanda, just sitting here and had a talk. Um, 
there was this question of Ubuntu came up and he said, he took a position saying that, yeah, we had Ubuntu, but we also had a genocide, you know? There is, of course, the concept of adapt in Persian and Arabic, which connects with Bildung in German. There is Nunchi in South Korea. So I work with this concept of hospitality in which, as Richard um, Riley put it, is at the heart of the book. How this concept, opening up to this concept is a, is a question of not only linguistic hospitality, but historic hospitality. So there are those concepts, and this takes us to the to what Derrida and Adorno discussed, Adorno and Zygmunt Bauman as well, that how could we have Holocaust when we had enlightenment? So this takes us back to Rorty's question, how many people do actually know about these concepts? And, and you, of course, in the book, and Richard, and so it comes back to it why many people do not know about this concept because of the colonial violence and the domination of a certain, uh, a politically motivated and controlled epistemology, what can be taught and what can, you know, what can be memorized. So I just wanted to, uh, to thank you. And, and I have learned um, how about how the book stretches our relation to an understanding of Africa, India, China, or Asia, Europe, Americas, or North and South America, and the so-called Middle East by, you know, these questions came to me by simply asking how many languages did the philosophers who wrote of one history, one humanity, and one mind speak? And also, it, it asks every reader, how many languages do you actually speak? And what, you know, and this question of can you translate, meaning can you travel between languages? And the question of traveling, once we travel to another context, we learn that, okay, I have to, I have to learn to speak the language of the country, or I must know that the language that I have learned is not there. But at the same time, you know, when I came to South Africa in 2008, I was shocked that everyone must speak English, you know? Uh, and everyone who comes here must speak English, right? We have to also publish this as English. And that is what you what you raise a question of linguistic hospitality that opening up to these concepts is opening up to histories and humanity. So there is always more than one humanity, more than one mind in the sense of definitions. And that is to me, the question of Edward Glissant's that the ethics of hospitality is at the root of speaking and writing. So I just want to thank you. I want to thank Richard and thank Zoe and Subhashini, I think is not with us, but I will email her. I want to thank everyone who managed to be with us. So we have, we had about more than around 200 people who registered, but it's always like that, not everyone. Yeah, up. <laughs> but I also want to thank all of you uh, who are here, uh, Michael, Anya is also based in Johannesburg, director of the idea. Um, Shaul and Kayla, uh, Vanessa and Janet. Thank you for being here and thank everybody, everybody and wish you all a pleasant moment wherever you are. Thanks. Yeah.